and we're live. So good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. I'm Joanne Bernard. I'm the president and CEO of Easter Seals, Nova Scotia, and I'm currently a board member with the Halifax Chamber, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm speaking from Halifax, which is in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. I acknowledge the peace and friendship treaty signed in this territory and recognize that we are all treaty people. The Halifax Chamber is pleased to celebrate pride all year round. It's so important to keep these conversations going. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people know my background, but I was elected to the, Hel to the Nova Scotia Legislature in 2013 and I am the first openly gay um, MLA and cabinet minister in the history of Nova Scotia. So I can't tell you how important it is to keep these uh, conversations going forth uh, because during my tenure, homophobia was very much present uh, in my life and in my career. And I always kept the conversation going and addressed it head on. So this is wonderful that the chamber uh, is doing this today, but they, they address um, pride all year long, which I'm really proud to be part of an organization that does. So I'll now pass everything over to Blen, uh, Ben Cloutier from TD. Ben, go ahead. Thanks so much, Joanne. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Cluche, and my pronouns are he and his. I'm currently a branch manager with TD Bank, as well as part of the LGBTQ2 plus business development team. So I'm joining you all today from my office in Halifax, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm also in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm pleased to have this event become a reality today. COVID has turned everyone's business upside down and inside out, and it feels like we've been in this global pandemic a long time. Given my background and penchant for numbers, I did a little calendar calculation. And do you know that we've made it through more than 1400 hours, about 588 days, or just over 84 weeks of this global pandemic together? I'll say it again, it's been a long time. Yet there is a silver lining. With the shift to virtual programming, we could quickly and easily break across geographical boundaries and throw aside room capacity numbers, allowing for guests and participants from all over Atlantic Canada join us for this important conversation today. Something we would have never imagined or considered before. More silver and some might say gold is that small businesses, business people like you, are the backbone of our economy and together you make up 98% of all business operations in Canada, employ over 70% of the total labor force in the private sector and contribute to more than 30% to our gross domestic product. A Nielsen study that looked at the national LGBT businesses are LGBTQ2 plus letter owned amounting to some 28,000 businesses from coast to coast who are generating about 1% of gross corporate revenue here in Canada. Many of these businesses are young, less than three years in existence, who are owned, operated, or managed by young Canadians under the age of 54 from the LGBTQ2 plus community. TD is an out loud and proud champion of the LGBTQ2 plus community and small business. From entrepreneurs and professionals to executives, we understand and know that you have a business vision for today and for the future. We support LGBTQ2 plus customers through a variety of inclusive policies, communications, development programs, and initiatives. In 2018, we delivered gender language and concept training to approximately 800 employees and evolved our scope from LGBT to LGBTQ2 plus to recognize and be inclusive of gender and sexual diversity of our community. 
We have been building our pride year after year since 1994, when we became the first Canadian bank to provide same-sex spousal benefits to employees. In 2014, TD launched a unique LGBTQ2 plus business development team. And in 2017 and 18, we featured gay and lesbian customers in small business month marketing campaigns. We want you to know that we see you, we understand you, we support you, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I wanted to say thank you to the Halifax Chamber of Commerce for hosting such an important conversation and to the panelists and moderators. Thank you for joining us today and helping us discover more silver linings during these pandemic times. And now I'm excited to pass it along to Daryl Sherman, who's the co-founder and CEO of CGLCC, which is Canada's LGBT plus Chamber of Commerce. Good morning and thanks so much, Ben. It is great to be here with everyone. Um, so my name is Daryl Sherman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the CGLCC, which is Canada's LGBT plus Chamber of Commerce. My pronouns are he, him. I'm actually based out in, in Toronto, but I did spend uh, six great years living out in Halifax. And so I'm, I'm really glad to be part of this, uh, this session here. So this, the CGLCC is a national nonprofit organization with the mandate to improve economic opportunities for LGBT plus businesses and entrepreneurs. We work to economically empower the LGBT plus community with the goal of creating a truly inclusive economy. You know, Ben gave you some, some stats there. Um, and so we know that LGBT business is important for Canada. And, um, you know, we actually just earlier this year, we updated uh, our la last landscape study. And, and so some of those numbers that Ben gave, we've actually seen increase. And so we now know that uh, there are over 100,000 LGBT owned businesses across Canada. And I think, you know, you know Ben mentioned 28,000. I think what we, we found is, you know, when we did that first study is, is that LGBT plus businesses are still hesitant to self-identify. You know, there's, there's some challenges that they face, and I think we're going to get to some of those here um, in, in a little bit. But we also know, as, as you mentioned, that they contribute up to over $22 billion of economic impact to the Canadian economy. You know, they're creating jobs, they're paying taxes. So LGBT businesses are significant contributors to our economy, and yet we're underrepresented in corporate and public supply chain. We face challenges in starting or scaling their businesses, and experience unique barriers due to their own individual status as part of the LGBT community. And yet with that, you know, they remain generally optimistic about the future. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here this morning with everyone to discuss the power of LGBT business across Atlantic Canada. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's conversation. We have local business owner, Jess Healy. Jess is a small business owner in Kentville, Nova Scotia. She started her business, Healy Enter Events and Weddings in 2015, hosting and planning of weddings on her family farm. The space has grown uh, since in a popular Nova, uh, Nova wedding venue, sought out by many each year. Jess lives in Halifax with her wife and three-year-old son and spends time between the city and the valley. We also have with us Martine Roy, she, her, hers, as her pronouns, uh, from TD. As regional manager of the LGBTQ2 plus business development, uh, Martine's primary role is to serve as a trusted liaison between TD and the LGBTQ2 plus community. Next is Cynthia Sweeney. Cynthia spoke at our event yesterday, actually, about being a better ally. We are very happy to have her with us again today. Cynthia is a CEO, consultant, author, and podcaster. Her passion for communication inspired her to focus on elevating the voices, visibility, and representation of trans people in all levels of business, employment, and community engagement. And we also have our host, Joanne Bernard, here to answer a few questions. Joanne, as you heard, is a board member of the Halifax Chamber and CEO of Easter Seals. She is a leader in both program development, evaluation, and public policy. And, and as she mentioned, she's definitely a trailblazer. And so I want to personally thank her for keeping the conversation going and, and tackling it head on, as she mentioned. So thank you. Um, so again, welcome to all of you. What, we, what I'm going to do here is actually um, start with giving you each an opportunity just to introduce yourselves a little bit more and maybe speak to a question that... Um, um, I'll post to each of you. And so, Jess, maybe I can, uh, we'll start with you. And maybe if you just want to introduce yourself a little bit more and maybe speak to kind of the state of the LGBT business, uh, small business community. Um, and um, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about your business. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Jess Healy. Um, I, um, my pronouns, Jean, her, and uh, I own uh, Healy Events and Weddings, which is a, 
a wedding venue in the Annapolis Valley. Um, I started the business six years ago now. It was uh, started after my own wedding. My wife and I got married there. And then we found that we had so much support from the community and all of our guests that were there that everybody encouraged us to turn our uh, our our wedding venue into a business and we kind of rolled with it from there. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, my goal with the business itself um, is to create a safe space for people to get married and celebrate love and have events at. Um, and the business has grown um, over the past few years as well, where I've been able to connect couples um, with other venues around around the area and help them, you know, find safe safe spaces to, you know, celebrate together. I think that's it. Great, <laughs> great. Thanks so much. I was trying to find the unmute. It's still too early in the morning, apparently. Here, um, thanks, Jess. Uh, Martine, maybe we'll, we'll turn it over to you and maybe you can just, uh, again, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about the, the role that you do and, and why you do that at, at TD. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Martine Roy, and uh, that role is very special because, uh, Daryl, it's TD is the only financial institution that have this role, uh, business development and the LGBTQ community. But this come from a while back, IBM was the first one and they did that in 2005. So I think IBM and TD work very uh, closely together and influence each other. And what it meant is like we do have those employee resource group and company and all that that are great ambassador for the company but we needed to go more because it's not just a social entity uh, lgbtq2 plus community it's more than that it's a life it's part of our life it's part of everybody's life so it was to bring it to business to to realize it is part of business and this is what we're talking about today it does affect every business small medium large corporation we're everywhere we're part of and it's funny i had somebody talking to me two days ago i hadn't realized about inclusion and diversity in the workplace or in businesses i never stopped myself to think about that and that's what it is so critical to bring it to the level of business so this is my role is to bring it to that level and i have the pleasure to work with customer with colleagues and with community partner. And what I try to do is connect the three. So like to support a great community partner will encourage my employee. I will get them to volunteer or work on that event and all that. And that will support my customer by doing all those things. So for me, it is the greatest role ever. I hope that every company has someone like me. Uh, for sure, it's going to do some competition. But I think it does the link, you know, and it brings that credibility and that business side of it that is there. We're part of the business, uh, the LGBTQ2 plus community. Thank you. I, I love that. And clearly you're passionate about what you do. And, and I also think it's, I, I would echo that. I think it's important that, you know, although sometimes we get rooted in this, this fear of competition, I think, you know, if we want to advance um, LGBT plus inclusion, uh, you know, we all need to be looking at this and working together, you know, corporations uh, working alongside. So, you know, I think that was a, a great point. Um, Cynthia, maybe you can um, uh, kind of introduce yourself. And I know, I, as mentioned, you you spoke on our, our panel yesterday around allyship. And so uh, maybe you can just talk a little bit also about what it means to be an allied business uh, operating in Halifax. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Daryl. Um, Yes, I'm Cynthia, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the founder of Simply Good Form. We're a consultancy that focuses on beyond binary thinking. So we're really supporting the breaking down of stigma and barriers um, facing members of the trans and non-binary community across Canada. And um, for us, we're, I mean, we're socially focused enterprise. I am an ally, a, a very fierce ally. So at, at Simply Good Form, I, we contract only members from within the 2S LGBTQ plus community with a specific focus on giving voice um, and opportunity to trans and non-binary members so that we can share stories with authenticity and um, help break down barriers um, quite basically from the ground up, from, from an empathy building um, model. And it's been really wonderful because I've, I, I've had the opportunity to work with um, 
a couple of members, specifically some trans women who have had to leave their jobs because of, of transphobia, because they were outed and um, they could come and contract a little bit with us, but um, they weren't able to do a lot of work while they were kind of reprocessing and perhaps in mediation or, um, but their experiences are very real and they're, you know, they're very current and present. And so them having space to be able to help educate others and, and make other businesses more um, accepting and welcoming and ensuring that their policies are, are aligned with the human rights code is, is super important. And just one other really important aspect with, um, with Simply Good Form is um, Isaac and myself, we co-host uh, a podcast and it's fully volunteer. And we've had an amazing opportunity to talk with um, LGBTQ2 plus business owners um, from around the Maritimes and across Canada. And we really want to highlight, um, it's called Hey Sis, and the whole point is connecting cis people um, with the LGBTQ and the trans community and amazing things that they're doing. So, um, so that's a really great opportunity for anybody who ever wants to come and talk about what they're doing um, and something unique with us on the podcast. We'd be happy to elevate and support you and um, and help share what you're doing um, out there. That's great. Thanks, Cynthia. You know, you're you're doing some great work, and and I think we're we you know in the in the virtual green room earlier um, this morning here. You know, we were doing what we're supposed to be doing at the Halifax Chamber, and we were we were talking business already. So you know, Cynthia and I we talked about how we can start to do some work together. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Joanne, maybe you can um, uh, speak a little bit about uh, what is the biggest challenge and opportunity you see in the LGBTQ2 plus small business community now? I, I think um, the challenges uh, are uh, <clears throat> in the same as the regular challenges for uh, um, a business owned by uh, you know, not a member of, of our community. Um, but there's that added, added pressure, I think. And, and it's interesting because I have two friends that just opened up a uh, accessory and furnishing store in Moncton, uh, two, two men who have been married for quite a while. And they just opened this week. And some of the conversations have been around um, how, how do you identify that you're a, a gay owned business? How do you identify that it's a safe space? Um, because as a consumer, I'm often tasked with trying to figure out, particularly in the tourism industry, whether or not an Airbnb is gay friendly, whether or not um, my family's going to be accepted. I'm married. Um, I have a grandchild that we go with. So I, I just, um, I know that there's lots of challenges for businesses, just in terms of, um, you know, you talk about the hope that everyone has, and that's great. But my personal experience uh, has been, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done around homophobia um, in the context of Nova Scotia. So what a, a small business in Halifax may face may be far less than what a small gay owned business might be in a rural area. And I think those, those differences are, are very uh, real and very profound. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where let's let's start focusing on that. But before before I, I pose the first question here to Jess, maybe what I will just remind everybody that's on the line, um, feel free, we will be taking questions, we're going to try to, um, we'll take them at the end, we have time at the end. So feel free to put the your questions in the Q&A um, chat at the, the bottom of the your screen there, and we'll we'll get to them. Um, if not kind of during, we'll certainly get to them at the end here. So, um, so you know, so on, on some of the challenges, and, and, and thank you for that, Joanne, you know, on some of the challenges, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go back to, you know, kind of some of my earlier comments there, and, you know, and um, from the research that we've, we've done earlier um, this year with Deloitte, we found that 20% of LGBT plus businesses indicated experiencing challenges starting or scaling their business because of being LGBT plus, you know, some of those specific challenges um, to your to your point, Joanne, are, are kind of very similar that every business faces, including accessing financing, inability to access mentorship, finding suppliers, you know, networking within your sector. So, um, 
But, you know, it's some of the other findings that I really found, you know, I guess, disturbing for lack of better words, you know, is like one third of LGBT entrepreneurs on at least one occasion have purposely hidden the fact that their company has LGBT ownership. You know, one in four have faced discrimination in the past because of LGBT plus ownership. And 23% indicated that self-identification as having LGBT ownership has resulted in a loss of opportunity. So, you know, some of our businesses are actually losing business because they are LGBT plus. So, so Jess, my first question to you, I, I know that um, some of that is not the most encouraging, but you know, let's talk about some of the challenges that you have faced um, as an LGBT uh, small business owner. Um, I guess to just piggyback on, on what you just said, um, I definitely in the beginning of being a business owner, um, I was certainly nervous about, you know, the people in the local community, uh, you know, just to come straight out and say that I was a, a queer business owner. Um, so definitely that would have been one of the challenges that I faced in the very beginning. Um, you know, I have gotten a lot of support from, from the community that my venue is in Kempville. So I've, I've been able to have a lot of support from some of the locals and, you know, uh, it's definitely helped me, you know, move forward with my business there. Um, some of the challenges that I faced though, you know, being from a small town and trying to grow my business is um, the town of Kempville itself is actually capped the amount of weddings that I can have. And I've had to get up in front of the town council and say this reason, this reason, this reason as to why, you know, my business makes sense for the community and it should be able to grow. And I've, I've definitely run into some hurdles with that. Um, I also have had some issue with some neighbors. Um, you know, I've, I've noticed a correlation um, with whenever I get some, um, you know, some negative comments toward, uh, towards my business, or even, you know, if somebody calls the town the day after we're after a wedding, I often find the correlation between, um, you know, if it's a member of the, our community or a uh, different ethnicity. So there's, um, you know, just even go on to say a little bit about what Joanne was saying, where, you know, that's definitely been a struggle in the rural area for me. That said, I've also had some lovely you know, interactions with neighbors as well. There's just a few who will certainly need to be um, uh, educated a bit more about, um, you know, the community, so. And, and I, I should have warned all of the, the panelists here that I, I sometimes like to take a little side uh, step and, and, and throw things off in a little bit different direction. But to build on some of the things that you just talked about, Jess, you know, how important is it for you to, to identify as a, as a queer owned business or as a, a LGBT plus owned business? Um, it's so important to me. I, you know, it's become more and more important to me as I've gotten a little bit older. Um, you know, I, you mentioned in my bio earlier, earlier that I'm a mother of a three-year-old boy. Um, so, you know, I, I've raised him in a, a same-sex partnership and, you know, I love my family and feel so passionate about it that, you know, I identify as a mother as well as a business owner. So I think the two correlate together. I feel so passionate about wanting to, you know, educate, educate people and, um, you know, um, show how, you know, a mother and a, a business owner can be a strong person. <laughs> no, and 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 I agree. And I think you know we we quite often talk about the importance of you know bringing one's whole self to to work, right? You know, typically we're talking corporations, and we want to in, ensure that our employees feel that they are included and in part of of the the workplace. But you know, I think it's the same as as entrepreneurs. I think if we want to bring our whole selves, we need to bring our whole selves to work if we wanna be the most successful that we can be. Um, and so I, I, I totally agree. I think it's important that as, as queer or LGBT plus entrepreneurs, we need to be able to freely indicate and, and express who we are. Um, I, I actually, I said I, I'm based in Toronto, but I'm actually just based outside in, in rural Ontario in the small community um, in Prince Edward County. And uh, just last, um, over the last couple of months, a, a wine bar opened up and it is a gay owned wine bar and they have very, you know, purposely positioned themselves as a, uh, not positioned themselves, but have, you know, um, expressed that they are a gay owned couple uh, that own this bar. And there has, I think, similar experiences to what you've uh, talked about, Jess, you know, some, some challenges and backlash that they've got. But I think on the flip side, some also really encouraging support and um, uh, I guess 
um, alignment with a lot of the other community members and uh, businesses here. So, um, so Cynthia, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to you. you know, we're talking about some of the, the challenges and, and I know that you're an allied business, but your business is very focused on the LGBT plus community as you talked about in the trans community. Um, so have you faced any challenges or obstacles in kind of what you're doing? Um, well, I mean, just thinking of what Jess was saying there, um, I mean, it's a real balance. It, it, it's a it's a it's a fine balance that um, you you have to um, to judge, I guess, what you know where you are in the intersections of you know being out and and being loud and proud, which is is so so important um, with you know the possibilities of of, of negative. Um, interactions that you might have from community members and then who will be your allies and, and who will support you. Um, it's for Simply Good Form, we started quite small um, and I'm, I'm the parent of a, of a trans child and there are a lot of balances there because um, they support what I'm doing, uh, they're they're a teenager now, but you know I really had to balance how much do I put myself out there um, because I could be um, potentially outing them in a situation, um, and so I, I have to balance that because uh, I acknowledge that they transitioned in elementary school, so at that point their opportunity to say be stealth or um, for people to not know that they're trans was taken away from them. They didn't have that opportunity, but as they get older, um, that changes and the geography of their life changes. But we talk a lot as a family about, you know, they've never felt well, they have, but they don't want to live in shame. They don't want to feel like they should hide and they want to have authentic relationships with the people that they meet. And so I guess I'm balancing that all the time. And I'm also acknowledging that um, I think the service that we offer is, is, is very valuable and important, but I do acknowledge that there are other um, diversity and inclusion consultants that are doing this work across Canada and their businesses are run by uh, trans or, or members of the 2S LGBT community and, and I'm an ally. And so I do recognize that, you know, I don't ever want to step on anyone's toes. I feel like there's enough work to be done and enough voices to, to bring to the conversation, but I am always very cognizant of that too um, and supporting the others that are out there doing amazing work because we can't be in every place um, at all times. And I think everybody's voice has something to contribute. Yeah, and, and I think you're, you're right. It's it's unfortunate that there's so much work that needs to be done out there still. Um, but, you know, so thank you for the work that you are doing and 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 others out there that are, are helping to, to kind of educate and create that greater awareness. You know, Martine, maybe, you know, in your role, you obviously work very closely with LGBT plus businesses. And so i um, curious of what you're kind of hearing from your businesses out um, in Quebec and, and out east here. What are some of the things that they're experiencing? What are some of the challenges that they may be facing? Well, it's a little similar at what was our really express for sure when you get in Montreal or you get in the city it's a little bit easier uh, that when you go in rural when even Quebec City is harder uh, so when you go in New Brunswick is the same thing Nova Scotia I found way better than St. John New Brunswick and and uh, we'd say that Nova Scotia so they do talk about it and for sure it's not easy because to be out like uh, I saw some businesses like in St. Andrew New Brunswick it's easier to have that little boutique and have uh, your flag there because there's so many right when you arrive in a new place uh, let's say Northern or something like that or a little town like uh, uh, Jess was saying then it's more difficult because there's a clash. First, we don't, didn't talk about it, but there's the intersection. Uh, being a woman, first and foremost, starting a business is hard as a woman. Then do you bring the bisexual, the lesbian and yourself or the transgender to the table? That's the question. And when you're in a smaller town, there's the religion that comes in the way too. Uh, and you don't want to offend anyone. You, you're not trying to change anybody, anything, but it is there. So all do you, that's what people talk to me about, right? So they're going to be more inclined to go start their business in a town like Halifax uh, and more and feel more protected. But I think we're 
slowly getting better at like Cynthia, what she's doing is amazing because she can go in those small businesses and all that and help those people to say, hey, it's okay. Okay. and there's law and you're safe and I, I like since you always bring the human right but I'm a commissioner of out for the human right uh, commission in Quebec and I'm in the charter and she's right we have all the right behind us to help us so I think it's a question to help each other and me as with TD I can sit down and I can help I can even bring what we do in our corporation about pronoun, about politics, about visibility. When I when we decide to put wrap around a branch, we don't just say, oh, look, put wrap on all the branch. We really take our time. We really say, okay, I think this one could be a good hit, you know, so we're going to do it there. We even changed it at one point. It was just Nova Scotia. Then we went Newfoundland as well. We went St. John. We went Moncton. Visibility. We're trying to help those businesses. We're trying to be there as a corporation saying, hey, we are fully inclusive. It is a safe place. We're going to come and help you. We're going to support you. We're going to give you tools as well. That's what I try to do. But yes, it is a big challenge. Um, and mostly like outside. And I think this is why it's so important what we're doing today and to keep on doing it. And those uh, uh, business like Cynthia are critical since we need more of Cynthia around the table. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you touched on something earlier on which is around the intersectionality. And I think that that's a really important piece because you know, I, I know that we've just been talking about kind of the, the challenges that LGBT plus businesses in general face, but I think when you start to layer in some of that intersectionality, especially with our BIPOC community, um, just such huge challenges and barriers that they face. And I know that, you know, we're here, all of our, our panelists on, on this virtual um, session here are, are white, um, but, you know, the, the challenges that those um, uh, those BIPOC uh, entrepreneur space is, is real. You know, we have a we have a youth program that supports young uh, queer entrepreneurs starting or growing their business. And I remember that um, early on we were when we we're kind of taking it where um, all of the, the candidates had to submit a video in, and one video submitted by a, a, a young black gay man in his video, he said, I never thought as a black gay man, I would have the opportunity to start my own business, you know, and those are the things that just, it just hits you, right? Like here, we're already, you know, as, as a young gay black man, he doesn't think that there's an opportunity for him to run his own business, right? So, um, you know, when you start to look at the, the intersectionality piece, the, the, the obstacles and challenges are just that much greater. Um, so I, know, I don't want to keep dwelling on some of the, the challenges, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about COVID quickly um, and it's and the impact that it's had on, on all small business. And so maybe I'll just kind of open this up to, to everybody here um, around the around the virtual room here is, you know, what have what have your experiences been with COVID? How have your businesses been impacted? Um, how have you adapted? And, and I guess what are we kind of what are we seeing uh, coming out, hopefully coming out of COVID here? So I'll, I'll open it up. I don't know if um, Jess, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> um, I, you know, when COVID started unraveling uh, as a business, things just started crumbling on my end. Nobody, you know, there were no events allowed to be had. So all of a sudden I went from having a full season of weddings uh, and events to, you know, people were kind of dropping like flies, canceling their wedding. And so from the get go, I was working with people who either wanted to cancel or wanted to postpone. So I was working to, you know, rebook dates. Um, and then, you know, as things started to reopen again, I had to, you know, navigate through, you know, making sure people were wearing masks and, you know, all of the, the normal mandates that people had. And then, you know, recently my last wedding, I of course had to check vaccine passports and people's licenses. And so, you know, I've had to learn how to adapt uh, to the new way of life. And, you know, I've also had to navigate people's emotions because weddings are very emotional times. So, um, you know, help people get through those emotions as well. And, um, you know, work through all the different layers of, of what COVID has brought brought to, you know, throwing events. Um, it's been really interesting. 
I think it's an understatement to say weddings are emotional times, but yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I'm not sure uh, if anybody else wants to kind of address the COVID issue, sure. Cynthia. Yeah, I mean, it, it gave us an opportunity to pivot for sure, but we were in a situation where we could really embrace technology. And in many ways, like for um, the PFLAG online support groups, and then the support groups that we do online for parents of trans and gender expansive youth, um, originally they were in person once a month, but we were able to take them online. And it just uh, expanded our reach. We were able to connect um, and create a village for people that are perhaps more in a more rural location that couldn't connect with people. So we're actually gonna con continue with that model. But I was also just gonna add um, for, for business owners that are to us LGBTQ plus, um, you know, I like it really, COVID really made me go local um, and really focus on local. And so I could do my research online and places like Etsy, and that is where you can, you know, really find local businesses that are, you know, like say indigenous art and, and queer, um, queer owned businesses that are creating amazing things. Um, and like, for instance, there is the, the Queer Exchange Facebook group here in Halifax, and I often see local um, businesses recommended there, and, you know, which I think is great. There's um, a dentist that we just started going to that opened up recently in Halifax, and um, their signage in the window, they have, um, they have a flag and they have lots of different stickers, and, and their forms are so inclusive, and, you um, and they were recommended in there. And for me, like as a family, like when I would take my child there, who's gender marker, you know, again, you're showing health information and there's that potential where I'm always nervous as a mom that they're going to be, you know, someone's going to go, oh, you know, wait a minute, they're, are they an M or an F or what, you know, they were absolutely amazing and I care about that my husband he would just say oh well is it going to hurt are they a good dentist whereas I would think you know I would look beyond that and say but is this going to be a safe space is this going to be a place that my son might walk away and go that was kind of weird I didn't feel good about that interaction um, and so I think it's so important for you know uh, queer owned businesses if if they're not necessarily out and, and marketing themselves specifically as that, but to definitely let the community know because, um, and share that because, you know, we need these safe spaces as well to be able to, to go to. And, and then it just sets great examples too as leaders, you know, within the community. We've worked with some amazing people. I won't take up too much time, but like transform voices here um, in Halifax they work with voice therapy but they ran a whole um, section on um, tra transformative voices helping um, trans women and, and non-binary people trans men with with voice therapy um, which is great and then there's also Charlie Johnson who's a queer realtor open and he's doing so much so amazing um, such amazing work for the community um, and giving space as well so for people looking to buy a new home it's a huge purchase and if you're a member of a 2s LGBT community you want it to go right you want to make sure that the person is is going to be culturally competent and and welcoming as well so I mean there are just so many great people that are are doing doing work in the community and I really love celebrating them yeah no that, that's awesome and I think you know we talked yesterday around the the um the buying power of the LGBT plus community and, and you know it's um around $97 billion just here in Canada. But, you know, that is just the LGBT community. But then you layer on, you know, uh, the, the friends and the family and supporters or people that just, you know, embrace and want to see um, more inclusion. You know, that, that power, that economic power is important. So I think, you know, there are people that are actively looking to do business with um, LGBT plus owned businesses. And so I, I, I agree. I think it's good for, for businesses as, as Jess had talked about earlier, you know, about being out and promoting yourselves. Um, and, and, you know, you, you also talked about the power of local. And I think that's really what we have seen help kind of get us through, get us through COVID quite often um, across Canada here is just that, that um, really engaging and, and um, leveraging kind of the local community. So again, um, I don't know if, Martine or Joanne, you wanted to talk about anything else around the, the COVID element? Sure. Um, Easter Seals, one of our programs is New Leaf and it's a social enterprise, so it is a business. Um, and we have a cafe here at our center, 
but we also ran a cafe down at Nova Scotia Rehab. So they were closed and we are still not back to full capacity at the Nova Scotia Rehab because of where it's located. So uh, we're not back to full operation there. So, uh, you know, apart from the business side and that revenue uh, being disrupted uh, extensively um, for, for nonprofits across the board, across Canada, uh, events were canceled, foundation work uh, was limited uh, because everybody was hit financially with this. So fundraising for uh, everyone was extraordinary. And I think what COVID has done, it has really highlighted the social isolation of vulnerable communities. So for persons with disabilities, or if you're a, a, a member of the queer community uh, living in, 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 a, in a rural or isolated area, your ability not to meet up or go to um, venues where you, you, you're with people you feel safe with was really highlighted during COVID. Um, and uh, so I think a lot of groups that rely on that social interaction were very negatively impacted in many very different ways. Yeah, and, and I, I fully agree. And I think that's where, you know, you saw, and I, I used the, the, the word um, pivot, and I know it's overused. Um, it's the, the most hated word in my vocabulary from last year, but I mean, it, it, it's so true. And I think that we've seen um, some amazing companies being able to pivot to be able to kind of continue to provide that support, you know, and as a national nonprofit, um, I, I totally I agree with everything you just said, Joanne, because, you know, our the challenge the challenges that we face, you know, we're representing small businesses, our small businesses are hurting, um, you know, we're hurting. Um, and so I think that we had to adapt and we had to, um, to pivot. And so Martine, you must have seen again in working with a lot of businesses uh, and your colleagues across the country you must have seen some really amazing uh, demonstrations of how companies that were able to pivot. We had to react, right? We had to react. So first was the program that the government was giving, trying to help all our customers go get those grants to survive. And at the same time, all the organization, community organization that we give money to, to do event or anything that we were going to prepare, the prides, we were all the prides were already paid and everything. We left all the fun to everyone. We didn't ask any organization to give back the money. We switched and right away we went for virtual. Uh, I had customer meeting, like I was supposed to meet them for the first time. I met them for the first time on WebEx. I really, we really switched because it's not something you could stop. There was life there. There was business there that was relying on it. And a business and a life, our salary, our family, you know, like it's a domino effect that it does. So for us, we really, as a team, uh, all the regional manager really sat down and really said, okay, all the program that we did, we leave it there. What else could we do? So we work with you, uh, Daryl, to do some great webinar, uh, right? To help people to connect and have some recommendation of what to do, how to do it and things like that. We did the same with Quebec. We did the same in Halifax. And we really try to, to be a support because it was a crisis. It was a crisis for everybody. It was a crisis for the bank. Uh, the bank had to really switch. Imagine everybody going home had to be online. Our line were crashing. The website was crashing. We were way too many to just switch in one day. So it was a big, big challenge. But in the same time, time we wanted to be close to our community and we know still today there's people that are still hurting because they're still not fully open they're still not like re-engage and everything and we still have to be there uh and that's was the thing i made myself really available uh, i was available by text people reaching out, reach me out from everywhere some people wanted to remortgage some like trying to be agile and flexible was the best time it was now. Uh, and I think this is what, when you see that you can have the same value, right? The same value than your colleague, the same value than the customer and, and the community is when you take the time and you, and we didn't stop the pride either. 
We didn't stop showing our color. We didn't stop putting the wrap. We just stopped the on-site event. Uh, and we're still not back uh, to on-site event. We're still virtual, but I think we're going to go in the hybrid way. But we wanted everybody to feel that we were there. But it was a very tough time, mostly when it stopped. You know, March uh, 2020 was like, uh, was something. It was, uh, I think everybody will remember that day, right? Yeah, and, and I will just take this opportunity to say thank you to TD for your continued support of, of the community broadly and also of the CGLCC. You, you, um, you made a really good point there that um, TD, as, along with many of our, our corporate partners, maintain their level of support because they know the importance of, of many uh, NGOs and um, civil society organizations and the role they play in advancing LGBT um, uh, rights and, and equality here in Canada, and they continued with their support. So thank you to TD to for, for your uh, ongoing support. Let's maybe let's shift the conversation now to ways that we can actually support our businesses overcome some of these challenges that we've talked about. So um, Joanne, we'll, we'll, I'll throw this to you here. Maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you can talk about some of the, the ways through the, the Halifax Chamber that you're helping uh, LGBT plus small businesses. So what are, what are some of the membership benefits uh, for an LGBTQ2 plus small business in, in Halifax and Atlantic Canada? Well, the, the biggest benefit would be the networking and the, and the fact that you uh, have access to hundreds of uh, businesses, uh, small, medium and large. Um, and, I, and I think the fact that um, the chamber uh, has done a fantastic job, particularly in the last year around EDIA. Um, and they walk the walk. Uh, so um, any, any organization or any um, uh, small business or, or any business that, that you know, identifies in our community uh, certainly has a safe place with the chamber and has access to all the benefits that everybody does. But even more than that, I think the public education piece within the chamber, the ability um, to have webinars like this, we to to have the support of of the board of directors and certainly the staff and the president and CEO of the chamber is extraordinary. Um, you know, I as a member of the board have had no issues in uh, and this is a volunteer commitment for me of going to a retreat and talking about my wife and it's perfectly safe and I feel perfectly comfortable and I think that would be uh, the the essence of what any conversation with any um, queer business owner would have in the chamber um, and as I also think that if that wasn't the case if there was uh, something that happened I think the chamber uh, would be extraordinarily proactive in correcting anything that um, might rear its head um, because they, they just do. I, I think they provide a level of service um, to, to not only queer or owned organizations and uh, businesses, but also uh, people of color, newcomers, um, they're just across the board, a safe place to be, and they're an advocate for business. And I think that's really important. Um, and they also recognize that every business that has its own personality, its own um, challenges, its own opportunities. Um, you know, when Jess was talking about, uh, you know, asking herself, do I identify as a queer owned business? Um, if you're not in the queer community and you want to open a business, that's not even something you think about. Um, you know, if you're a customer, if you're a core customer and you want to go to a B&B, &B, you don't ask, is it going to be okay if I just ask for, for a king size bed? Um, you know, when you run for politics, you don't say to your family, I'm going to, we're going to be out there, uh, you know, you have to be comfortable. If my wife and my son weren't comfortable, I wouldn't have run in 2013. So there's, there's that extra added of um, self-identification and thought that has to go into opening a business, 
uh, identifying as a queer customer and or, or even making a choice. If you go for a, a job interview in a company, you have to make sure that that company is uh, a safe space for you to be an employee there. Because uh, I won't work for anyone that doesn't accept my wife as my partner. And, and so Easter Seals is a beautifully safe space. We have clients who identify. I have staff that identify within the queer community. And so this is a safe space uh, for anybody. And uh, like the chamber, we walk the walk. So um, I think there's um, uh, lots of opportunity within the chamber to really come forward if you're a gay owned business and say, I want to be part of the chamber. Uh, I know it's welcoming and I know it's safe. And I know that I will have access to a wide uh, swath of business that um, will be welcoming to me. And, and you know, and I want to thank the chamber for, you know, you talk about walking the, the, the talk. And I think that this is a great example of, of the chamber doing that, you know, putting this and hosting this this session here, not only today, but yesterday's session around um, allyship, I think is really important. And so thank you um, to the chamber for, for doing that. You know, I think I'll take a second here and kind of build on, on what you talked about, Joanne. And, um, you know, as, as we also operate as a, as a chamber of commerce, but specifically for LGBT plus businesses, you know, one of the first things that we always say is, you know, you still need to be involved with your, with your local chamber of commerce. Like we are not here to replace the local chambers of commerce. They provide such a huge value and resource for, for businesses. Um, but as a, as a LGBT plus chamber of commerce, what we can do is, is really provide kind of that, you know, sometimes that that shared experience that many entrepreneurs are, are facing, you know, just kind of that, you know, what we've talked a lot about is, you know, kind of um, that safe, that safe space. Um, but we provide a lot of programming that supports our businesses in growing and, and succeeding. And, um, you know, I talked about our youth program, which is very focused around supporting young queer entrepreneurs. And, you know, there's great programs out there nationally, like Futurepreneur, um, to help youth start and grow their business. But, we know that there are gaps based, um, that our youth are, are, there's gaps in those programs that you know, queer youth um, are kind of falling through. And so, you know, our program's really meant to bridge that. So, you know, if you're a young queer entrepreneur, you know, reach out to us and learn about um, that youth program. And TD is actually one of the partners of that youth program. Um, we also, one of our, our core, core programs, and, and, and I kind of alluded to it early on is around, um, you know, access to, corporate and government procurement opportunities. And that's a big piece of what um, we do is we act as a certifying body for LGBT owned businesses and help to connect them with corporate and governments uh, that are actively looking to diversify their supply chain. You know, governments and, and corporates know the value of engaging with diverse suppliers. You know, I, I like to say it's the same as having a diverse workforce. It's, you wanna have a diverse supplier base for that kind of um, diversity of thought, different ways to approach um, problems, uh, innovation and, and, and things like that. So um, you're seeing more and more corporations actively looking to, looking to do business with queer owned businesses. And so again, TD, um, so if I'm looking out at East Coast, like um, Sobeys is, is starting to actively um, work and engage with diverse owned businesses the city of Halifax, Dalhousie, all looking at, at, at having programs to actively um, engage diverse owned businesses, including LGBT businesses. Um, you know, and, and I think Joanne too, one of the, the things you, you talked about, um, and I think, you know, kind of applies to Jess as well in, in conversations around finding kind of those, those queer friendly spaces. And um, one of our newest programs that we launched this year actually is an accreditation program, we call it Rainbow Registered. And it is really around um, recognizing those businesses that have um, inclusive uh, policies and practices in place and creating an, a safe space that are purposely creating that safe space for the LGBT customer as well as employee. Um, and so we go through a, a kind of a, a very rigorous process to evaluate their policies and practices and, and give them that you know, stamp of approval, if you will. And this was done in partnership with um, an, another national organization, the Canadian, uh, sorry, the Tourism HR Canada, um, and with support from the federal government. So this is really an important initiative uh, to make sure that all businesses 
uh, understand and have the ability to really create that safe space for our um, our employees and our guests. So, you know, so those are some of the specific ways I think from a an LGBT specific chamber of commerce that we're trying to bring value and support our our businesses. But um, I didn't need to derail this conversation. But maybe Mar Martine, I'll, I'll I'll kind of go to you now. Like. You know, again, obviously TD plays an important support role for many entrepreneurs and business owners. So you know, what, what support and resources are available from your local LGBTQ2 plus small business advisors? Well, we have those presentation, like I said, those webinar about the subject that you want, small in business, it can be acquisition, it can be uh, wealth, it could be, and, and we can do those webinars, they already, uh, so if you invite us, it would be our pleasure uh, to come, Ben or uh, Ashley or anybody from my, from my team and Halifax. The other thing, um, I just wanna go with what you said as well. I'm trying to find organization as well, that are not necessarily owned or run by LGBTQ, but that are inclusive and that they accept LGBTQ. Because for me, if this guy join in the venture, uh, it's gonna make more and mayor. So I find that like, because we put a lot of, of pressure on those, on that LGBTQ owner uh, to do that visibility and all that, but I think everybody should. And like that, it should not be like, oh, it's owned by LGBT. No, it's inclusive. It's a safe space and they embrace that. And that for me is what I'm trying to work more and more. Uh, it's to bring to the table those organizations that are inclusive and like this, merge them as well with small businesses and all that and work together. Um, I, I find it's a great connection that, that we can do at TD. Uh, and I have the power to say, okay, we're going to go help that organization. And I'm going to, like I'm doing it for a, a, a house where women like that went through violence and all that in Quebec. But that woman, that house exists, exists since 1932 and it take every woman. By taking every woman, you're gonna take the lesbian, the bisexual and the transgender. So I ask them to have more of that conversation and that organization. And I say, I'm gonna help you with some dollar to be able to do some, uh, some project and things like that. So that's one of the tools that I find is interesting. If you're a customer with TD, anytime, anytime you can pick up the phone and you can say, hey, I would like to have some tools or some ideas about bringing the conversation to my staff or putting something, you know, some signs or like I said yesterday, buying local, those box, you know, those local box, if you put your product in it, put a little touch that is LGBTQ or, or show inclusion and people will see it and they will go to your business. It worked with me. So it would work with a lot of people. So I think it's all those little things, you know, that I, we need to expand. We need to be like the ally is so important. And that's the, the best way to show your allyship in a way is um, embark with the other business that are owned by LGBT, but just show your color as well. So I, it's, I, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to find ways. I try to be innovative. I try to take the time. And like I brought earlier to that intersection, I personally find there's not enough women in the community, LGBTQ community that are out. I find that we don't talk enough about the L. We say LGBT, we see it really, really fast. We don't talk enough about the B. And when I look at study, 45% of the population thinks they're bisexual. So where are they? How come we don't talk about that? So it's that part because I find that the G, we, we have a good grasp on it, but all the L and the B and the T and the queer, we need and the two spirit, we need to get out, evolve and, and, and those people and support. And I think we need to support them. I'm really pleased to see Jess here and Cynthia, they're woman owned businesses, Joanne, you know, it, it is important. And then after it's the LGBT, but I find as a woman uh, as well. So in my role as TD, being a lesbian and being in that role for sure, I'm inclined to go and say, hey, where are all the lesbian and the bisexual and transgender of Halifax that I can work with and I can go do, 
you know, things like uh, I, I sponsor LSTW. It's Let's Spread the Word. It's a lesbian magazine and lesbian. Uh, there's an amazing portal. So I'm trying to go get those things to, and we like that. We're going to be even more Daryl, you know, if everybody embark, we're going to be more to show our color and like that we're going to work in collaboration with each other and i think you said it be before like that all uh, if you want to uh, purchase and, and 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 give your name you know to be in the procurement plan i think it's really really important because it goes both ways you know if i'm inclusive with you and all that I'm, that person's going to go by there so it's really like it's bringing a circle it's a very holistic way of thinking so uh, me, I think that we need to get bigger and get more people putting their color out there. Daryl, I'll just um, okay. direct you. We have four questions that have been asked. If you, I don't know if you have access to those or not. I, I, I do, and I, it's funny, uh, Joanne, because I was going to remind people to put questions in, and then I realized I wasn't actually looking at the questions. So, <laughs> thank you for, for that. Questions. Um, and, and I know that Cynthia has to leave in about 10 minutes and there's, I think that there's um, a, a great question here from, from Lindsay that I'll, I'll throw to, to, maybe to you first, Cynthia, which is around what advice would you give small business to proactively create a safe space for our LGBTQ plus business? Do you want to take a, a crack at that? Yeah, sure. So just repeat, um, what advice would I give to just a general business or a 2SLGBTQ owned business? To a small business to proactively create a safe space. Yeah. Oh, well, so to a, an AMSB, I'm, I'm assuming that's a small business, but am I? Business. Yes. Yeah, yes. well, I think, you know, it's definitely engaging in, in the conversation. You know, you can, you can connect with, um, we do diversity and inclusion workshops and we work with small businesses and we do, you know, just getting you started beyond the binary and then looking at your internal policies. Um, I think you have to recognize that it's, it's definitely a journey and, and there's no finish line, but the fact that you're asking the question is fantastic. Um, because as I talked about yesterday, it, it's more than a sticker, um, but you definitely, yeah, representation and visibility is important, but then it's thinking deeper about, you know, how can you, how can you be welcoming? What kind of language are you using? What message are you sending in your job postings or your social media and things like that? Um, and then it's being aware of the why. So the marginalization that does exist. Um, within the community and then being cognizant of that. So there, there is a lot of different layers and, and that's why we love engaging with small businesses um, to talk about, you know, how can you be, how can you be more welcoming and, and how can you connect with other queer owned businesses um, to maybe, you know, you know, cross be inspired. I think people are, you know, they're doing so many different things and it's always very unique by industry. Um, and I think it's just engaging in the conversation, not being afraid to make a mistake. And that's what we hear a lot from our clients. They just want to get it right. If they're going to say they're inclusive or they're certified inclusive, they don't want to make a mistake. And so what we say is, what we do is we certify intention. Um, and so the intention is ongoing because no space can ever be guaranteed as safe. It's uh, only as good as the people that are in it and the policies. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, that now that you're thinking about it, I would reach out to an organization, whether it's us or, or another organization that is here or locally, um, and to talk about maybe, you know, having some training, um, especially for other staff that you're bringing on board, what kind of information should they know when they're serving your clients and answering your phone or, um, you know, being a good service provider. Um, and then, you know, you can start creating your policies and, and your own values and morals around, you know, how you want to be inclusive and welcome, welcoming from there. Sorry, I'm long-winded sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's great. And I think that um, you're right. I think that there's uh, there's some great resources out there. You know, we certainly we talked about some of them yesterday, um, but you know, certainly reach out and and maybe what I'll do is just invite all of the panelists here because there was a, a comment here. Maybe if if all of you are comfortable putting your contact information in the chat for everybody so they can reach out. I'm not sure if the chamber will send out kind of a, a follow up post to this, but maybe um, there's a couple of people that express interest in connecting with with all of you. So. Um, if you if you're comfortable with that, put your contact information there. You know, to to build on kind of what you you mentioned, Cynthia, 
you know, I think um, at least for us at the chamber, we have um, some great resources to help businesses. You know, I talked about the Rainbow Registered, but we have um, diversity inclusion training. We have an online program. We have more uh, in-depth uh, facilitated sessions, which are really focused on creating that inclusive workplace. I'm not sure, you know, if um, Joanne, if the Halifax Chamber of Commerce has resources, but you know, um, I'm sure that they'd be able to at least direct you or connect you with with members like Cynthia that can that can support them in in some of those uh, ways. So I would, uh, you know, to Lindsay, you know, I would suggest maybe starting with reaching out to the chamber and, and asking, you know, where are some resources that I can um, uh, tap into. So um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to uh, address that question or. So I, I wanted to go back to you know, a comment that you made, Joanne, which is around the importance of uh, one of the important roles that the chamber plays is around, uh, around the networking and, and the connections. And, and so, you know, Jess and Cynthia, you know, I, I'm curious where, where you found, you know, how have you built your network? Where have you found um, you know, really beneficial and, and what are some of the resources you need to help build that, that business or network? Cynthia, I can let you go first if you have to drop off. No, that's okay. I have a few more minutes. Okay. You go ahead, Jess. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, um, I guess it originally started with my social network. I found that, you know, just being open with everybody about my business and continuing to talk about uh, myself and, you know, my my passion of pursuing a safe place for um, people to celebrate love. Um, that was definitely where it started. Um, and then of course, uh, it would, it spread to, you know, the LGBTQ community, um, as well as others, of course. Um, and, you know, uh, the coast, uh, immediately jumped on board, uh, you know, at the very beginning of my business and, and kind of put us in there and we did some advertising through them. And then it was mostly just word of mouth. Um, you know, I, I've also become known in the local community a little bit as well. So I've made some more allies as, as my business is built and such. And then, then of course, you know, people who, who come to our business and work at our business alongside of us, such as, you know, photographers, caterers, florists, videographers and such, and, you know, building those relationships with those people, you know, the word spreads that way. And kind of, um, I think Cynthia, you used the word cross inspire earlier, and it kind of just falls right into all of that. So. I uh, I had the good fortune actually to meet um, to meet Jess and Ashley at uh, at an event by Pride at Work Canada. Um, and uh, it was hosted by TD on the day there as well, and uh, and was able to connect with with some people there, which was fantastic. Um, Pride at Work Canada, I think, was probably one of our first champions that helped um, helped us, and it was just through you know really for us. I was invited to speak on a panel during Pride, um, and then also another panel um, for the IWK with Pride Health, and it was um, at the time where we. We're slowly launching, um, but we had experienced some really bad transphobia in our family, and um, and I thought it was important to share that experience because it was around not talking about gender uh, identity and and um, the non-binary. And so, from speaking on one of those panels, uh, the Pride at Work panel, we we had our first client that gave us a call, and um, I had done a little bit of talks in school, but really we're just relying on the word of mouth right now from every good, um, you know, every good connection we make, and we hope that one client will lead to another, um, and we've sort of slowly, slowly grown from there. And I guess with COVID, which set us back and budgets were slashed on, on diversity and inclusion training, that's when we launched the podcast because we still wanted to be having these conversations um, and still, you know, getting information out there and connecting with people. And, and, and that's been really great. And so I just think it's important to be collaborative. And I've, in any business I've ever worked in, it's always about celebrating at others. There's space for everybody. And so elevating the voices of other businesses and people that are doing great work, then hopefully they'll recognize the authenticity in what you're doing. Support you.
Great, thanks. So there's there's another question here from from Diane, um, and it's the question is as chair of a small nonprofit language cultural center, the Alliance Francaise Halifax, how can we actively engage with the LGBTQ plus community? Um, I'm not sure, Martine. Do you want to take first crack at that one? Yeah, I would love to because uh, we're just this year uh, connected at the love. Uh, with the rest of the Pride of Atlantic, uh, with Tina Murphy, because there is that distinction. Uh, some people are, it's French language. So what do you do, you know, if you want to respect, because I always say when you're social, uh, you want to talk with your native language, it's, and it's normal, right? So all of TD for us, could we support as well the Pride or the organization that are more French owned and Moncton and all the way to Caracat, right? So that's why uh, we had a great news that we will support Acadzilla for the first time in 2022. Uh, and that's what I would answer this person is contact me and let me work with you and, and see because there is some connection and no matter uh, the barrier of language, we didn't stop that at TD uh, to, to work with everybody in the Atlantic. So it will be our pleasure uh, to connect and I can assist, uh, I'm fully bilingual, so I can assist in any translation or anything like this, but we have some uh, French speaking people as well. Uh, working at TD. So I would say, don't hesitate to come and contact me. Then I can talk and talk about the different program where we can assist and thing we can do. Everything that we do in English, we have it in French. So we can even do bilingual event, which I love those, by the way. I don't know, Jess, if you wanted to also touch on this one, this is again, um, like how can, how can they engage actively with the LGBTQ plus community? And we talked a little bit about networks. Are there some other ways that you think that they can actively kind of engage? Or you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just think, you know, continuing to talk about their openness and inclusiveness and, you know, being open uh, about, you know, the people they work with and, and their allies. Um, you know, I think that would just in itself speak, speak to, you know, their, their, um, you know, their mentality as a business. And I know that Cynthia has to drop in one minute now. Um, she's going to go on to a podcast here. But um, Cynthia, I don't know if there's any kind of last remarks or parting words that you want to give before you, you have to leave. Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to, to be a part of the conversation. And uh, alongside all these amazing panelists, and thank you for uh, moderating, Daryl. It's been a really good, enriching conversation. Thanks for joining us, Cynthia. Good luck in your podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now I was muted there. Um, I have one other question and, and kind of for, for everyone here is, you know, what else could we and, and should we be doing to better support our LGBTQ2 plus businesses? You know, what what do you what would you like to see uh, done in the community and, and perhaps um, within the chamber? To support uh, to support our businesses, so I don't know who wants to take a first crack at that one. Do I get to put somebody in the spot then? No, I'll go ahead. Okay, um, good. Thanks. No, I I would encourage businesses of any size um, that are in the queer community to join the chamber. Um, it is a, a safe space for business owners and it is a wonderful way to get your business front and center, um, loud and proud. Um, and so I would encourage uh, folks to, to, to join the chamber to do that. Um, and I, I also, um, and, and this isn't specifically for um, gay owned, you know, certainly for gay owned businesses, but all businesses that, um, uh, offer a safe space, identify. Um, and you know what, and that could be as simple as a sticker um, because, uh, or, or, or a statement on your website. 
um, because as a consumer, it's really important to me that I feel safe, not only in your business or your tourism uh, place or whatever, that's where I want to spend my money. It's as simple as that. Um, so those are, that's the, the two things that I'll, uh, my two cents worth there for that conversation. Great, thanks, John. Jess or Martine, Martine? I will jump on that because this is this is it. Right? Is is all can you show? And they say seventy two percent of the LGBTQ community is looking for that little symbol. And when they see it, they will go in. And it's it, it is like like it's a sentence. It's a little color thing. It's being in the the box like buying local and showing that color there it can be a scarf on the wall it can be little detail uh, people like they catch that very very fast and and like i was saying earlier more is mayor you don't need to be part of the community to do that if you're an ally of the community you should do it this is a perfect way of showing that you're an ally by doing that and what's going to happen is you're going to get more business. And that's like, it, it's not like a favor. It is like that. Um, I want to go in 2005 when TD decided to put their logo at Toronto Pride, so many people would draw their money that it was to be a decision there. It was a go or no go. What do we do? And at that moment, Ed Clark said non-negotiable. And it's been like that for 16 years. You're not going to tell me we lost, we gain. We gain in time by doing it and by being persistent and by being there and visible year after year. And then we're gaining business. We're getting ally business. We're getting, so it's the same thing. It's the same idea is if you show for sure, there was, they will be coming. Sometime when we put wrap around a, a, a branch, some people are going to say, oh, this doesn't look professional. They're going to find all kind of reason to say it's bothering them. But it's okay. They're going to get used to it. And if you explain to them why, and if you explain your community and why it's so important and inclusion, it's going to help out. But it's really a question of visibility. And I know it feels risky. I'm 58 years old. I was part of people that it was criminal to be homosexual. It was a mental illness to be homosexual we've been a long way now we can get married we can have children so people have to take a little bit more risk and i'm telling you at the end of the equation you can talk to ibm you can talk to td to all those corporations it's a gain it's not a loss it's really it, it's a very valuable and uh, you're going to gain amazing customer too mm -hmm. And, and I, I think I'll, I'll just build on that because I think it, it's certainly that <clears throat> that demonstration, but I think it's also making sure that you're following through. And, you know, and um, I think we, we kind of touched on it earlier, but um, it's one thing just to throw a rainbow flag somewhere, but it's also, it's about ensuring that you actually have those inclusive policies and practices. And, um, you, you know, you're absolutely right, Martine, is that the, the LGBTQ community is, is very loyal and they will, uh, they want to do business. We know the stats are out there that they want to do business with, with either LGBT businesses or uh, inclusive businesses, but they also want to make sure that they're, they're actually walking that talk that we talked about earlier, right? You know, and so you have to be able to demonstrate that you have those policies uh, and practices in place. Um, you know, it's the, the word, you know, pink washing and it's, you just can't, you don't want to be just showing up for pride as, as TD often talks about, you know, it's pride 365 being, being part of the community and actively engaging with the community, um, all year round. Um, Jess, did you want to, do you want to add anything else to that? Um, a little bit. I'm going to step outside of the box of my business to answer this question. Um, but, um, I, I recently walked into a very um, popular uh, business and with my son and I had to give some of my personal information and when I was standing there they asked me about my husband um, and it just the question just kind of rocked me because I was standing there with my son and I feel so passionately um, you know about my family and the fact that I had to stand there with him and say no my wife my, my partner and um, 
you know, it really upset me because this is the world that he's living in right now. And I don't think he sh should have to hear his mother explain about her family and what it looks like. So I think that's another thing that, you know, really could be focused on is uh, training employees to, you know, be more open with different words that you can use other than husband and wife or for example had that person have said partner to me it would have been a very smooth conversation um so you know stepping outside of the box of my business i think that is so, well i would do that in my business anyway but i think it's so important for big business and little business to be aware of how your employees are speaking to people um you know i i think that that would be a very uh easy thing to change and you know i would move businesses in a second uh if i thought that somebody was more supportive of my family yeah you know language is is so important and and quite often is that you know this not necessarily it's not intentional but the impact that it has right and um and for for small business you know, that if they have, if, if that customer has that negative experience, they, they may never tell you, but they'll just never show up again. You know, so you've lost business and you don't know why. And so I think you're absolutely right. That, that training and the use of language is, is really, is really critical. Um, we have one other question that came in um, from the audience here. So this is around what advice would you have for businesses that are co-owned and so we're technically 50% LGBTQ+. It's one of the barriers I've, they've identified in being a certified diverse supplier. It does hold us back a little from connecting with large national opportunities. Um, so if it's okay, I can, I, I can take a first crack at that and if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, so, and I think this may be in part relating to our certification program. So our, our certification program, supplier diversity, which I was referring to earlier, um, so we certify those businesses that are majority owned, operated and controlled by LGBTQ uh, individuals. So that is 51% or more. Um, and again, that is then to connect them with our corporate procurement opportunities. Uh, and this is a, a challenge, unfortunately, that um, we, we do have is if a business is not majority owned, but 50%, you know, so, um, and technically they are not eligible for certification. And, and it's something that we're certainly looking at doing um, uh, is, you know, how do we recognize those businesses that, you know, may be diverse in, in other ways as well. So maybe it's, you know, 50% by a, a gay male and 50% by a, a straight identified women, you know, which would not be eligible for certification, but is technically a very, what we define as a diverse owned business. So um, currently there's no kind of, as it relates to supplier diversity and certification, there's not an immediate answer for this, um, but it's something we're certainly looking at. I think though it goes back to, you know, so certification might not be on the table, but it's how are you engaging then still with um, our corporate partners um, as well as the chambers of commerce and so forth. So I would still suggest, you know, stay involved with, with your, your local chamber, your, your national chamber, keep um, in, engaging in those conversations because it is not that they um, are only looking to do business with, with uh, a certified diverse business. Um, certainly they're looking to, but they, they want to do business with um, anybody that is, is, has some level of, of diversity, it just may not be certified. So I would, I'd recommend that you just continue those conversations and continue to, to show up. You know, I think that that's a key piece. If you're, you know, for, for the small businesses that are on the line here, you know, membership in the Halifax chamber or the Canadian chamber, you know, is not, uh, is not a guarantee for business. Uh, you need to be showing up. You need to work that membership, but those memberships are a, you know a tool for you, but you have to you have to leverage it. You have to work it. So show up um, and be active. And I don't know, Joanne, if you wanted to add anything else around that, but absolutely. And oh, I just oh no, now you did it. There, All right. there we go. Absolutely, uh, there are uh, uh, of course benefits of being part of the chamber, but there's also opportunities if you want to test drive the chamber is to go to events um, for non-members and uh, um, see the value firsthand uh, and then make a decision then. So I showing up is just so important. Absolutely, totally agree with Daryl on that point. 
Right. Was there, I know that we're almost at time here. So I don't know if there's, if anybody else wanted to speak to that or if, um, if not, then maybe we'll just open it up. Um, Jess, you're un unmuted. Did you want to add anything? Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe what I'll Maybe what I'll do though is I'll I'll stay with you then, Jess, since you're unmuted, and and just you know for any parting uh, remarks, if there's anything else you wanted to to kind of throw out there from today's conversation. Um, I guess I I would like to say thank you for involving me. Um, you know I I I've I've been educated a little bit today, and um, uh, you know especially um, jo Joanne, I didn't. I've not worked with the chamber yet. So, you know, that's a nice connection to have. And, you know, I've always been, um, you know, uh, I've always loved to see the support that TD has also had for the community and, you know, two of my best friends work, work with you guys. So, uh, you know, I can't thank you enough for, for including me today. Thanks, Jess. Um, Martin. Well, it's the same. I'm very, very proud uh, for those two days and uh, to be here with the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much because it means a lot. For me, this is exactly what I'm talking about, to be part of an event that is uh, mainstream and all that, but that is inclusive and that we're able to show it off. Uh, it's so important because what it means is people can join without being scared and they know it's a safe space and even they can connect. And networking is the key, is the key, is the key of business, is the key of if you're looking for for work or anything like that, networking is key. So again, uh, don't hesitate to connect with me or anyone on my team, Ben Cloutier or Ashley Martel. We're here to help, uh, really. Uh, it is important for us because at the end of the day, when a business flourish, for us, we flourish. So it's a win-win for everybody. So anything we can give in that water to make this flourish, we will. We have tools and we love sharing them. So don't hesitate. Perfect. You know, Martine, thank you. And uh, thank you, TD, for your support of this event and for for being who you are and, and what you do. Jess, thank you so much for, for being uh, an active uh, LGBT plus entrepreneur. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for being here and sharing um, your, your words and, and experience with us. Joanne, I will um, want to thank you uh, also for being here and I'm gonna pass it back over to you to give a, a few closing remarks and, uh, and over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Daryl. It's been a great two days. Uh, I've I've learned like Jess has of some things. I, you know, I, I I I now won't curse my 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 interest charges and my service fees at the end of each month, Martine, because I'm a proud member of the TD Bank, <laughs> and I didn't know that they were the only bank that that uh, did this year round. So and and such intentional reaching out to the community. So that that makes me feel very good to be part of uh, the TD. Uh, a customer base. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today, including the panelists and TD. Um, we have a very special prize for one lucky attendee today, uh, TD Coin. And I'm hoping that Sandra is going to give me the name of the person who won that. And I'll wait for that, but I will move on. Um, and I also want to say that we're also giving $250 to the pride of each of our speakers choice. So for Jess and for Daryl and Martine and uh, Cynthia, um, and we'll, we'll be reaching out to, through the chamber to do that. Um, and let's see here. Uh, don't forget that next week is Small Business Week. Um, so proud of the chamber for doing this. It's always lovely to see uh, uh, events focused on the queer community outside of pride, because to me that makes it just more authentic, more intentional, um, and it's, it's just really important to keep the conversation going year round, uh, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gay 365, so there we are. Yeah. Um, so join us next week for in-person uh, conference, which is lovely to say, uh, on strategy for small businesses. And we have a great lineup of speakers, breakout sessions, uh, so to get your, your business ready for growth in 2022. 
So uh, I don't know who won the, uh, oh, the winner is Lindsay Squires. I looked in the wrong place. Lindsay will follow up with you right after this. Um, so uh, make sure that we have your contact information through the chamber. And again, everybody have a great day, a lovely weekend, and it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Merci. À bientôt. Thank you. Bye. Get out of this thing, please.